gotta be going somewhere cheaper. You gotta be just going to Walmart once a week. Or... It's not that far, it's 30 minutes. You know, like ag's kind of, it's kind of an old way to make a living now. Mm -hmm. yeah, everybody just has a job. And this farmland grows up or they put houses. So eventually, you know, we're, we're going to be looking at a scenario where, you know, there are fewer and fewer small farms and more and more big farms. And that's where, you know, you're going to be getting your milk from. Unless, you know, as consumers, you know, you really want to support, you know, small farmers, you know, staying in business. Um, if it's important to the consumer to do that, um, and to buy products from, you know, small farms, then, you know, that can keep some of us alive. We have two good customers of maple syrup from Jefferson. I don't know what, if they don't shop locally or they don't care. Walmart, they went from buying things in the cheapest manner possible to actually owning everything. They own the farms, they own the trucking, they own the processing plants, and they also own the shipping. So what that did was that took all that money that was used for all those side businesses and they made it singularly integrated. Um, and that's not the only reason why the dairy industry has kind of went downhill, but it's definitely a huge factor. Right. I mean, everybody wants to get the cheapest produce, the chip, cheapest everything, but in actuality, you're losing, you're losing family farms. You're losing that backbone of America. Our prices have to be good, because we're, you know, we're only raising 20 beef cows, we're not raising 2,000. Yeah. So it costs us a lot to raise it and butcher it. You know, butchering's 25% of our cost in there. Yeah. If raising's 70, you only profit, you know, 10% or less. Mm -hmm. And it's like, somebody comes and spends $6 and you only make 10% on it. What does 60 cents do for raising a family? Now, do we need money? Yes. But the extractive economy takes things like true wealth, the soil, the water, the sunlight, the air, happiness, true love, all these things, and an extractive economy says, in order to work, let's put them, let's make them scarce. It functions on a premise of scarcity. So if you believe that these things are hard to have, well then we extract them in exchange for money to get them back. Okay, so you're working on a linear model and it's extractive. So what you have is a system that is continually de depleted, continually creating more scarcity. So there isn't enough. If you farm in that model, you're screwed. This farm has been in my family for uh, 202 years. I didn't grow up, you know, with the idea that, you know, I wanted to milk cows. But when my grandfather passed away, um, I knew that there was no one else um, who was going to take the reins. So I decided that there was nothing more important that I was doing with my life at the time than, um, than what I could devote to being here. You know, we've learned a lot of lessons over the years. We've, you know, definitely been through a lot. And um, I think that uh, the biggest lesson that we learned with the creamery business is that, you know, we really need to focus on, you know, what we do best, what our lane is, which is butter. This was a dairy when I bought it, and we started the maple business. And now that's like doing well enough that it's a job, but it's not a full-time job. 
I mean, it is a full-time job, but it doesn't make full-time money. Both of our farms have stood the test of time because we are right next door to each other and, you know, we, we work together, you know, for doing field work and crops, um, you know, they do a lot of custom work for us, you know, we share equipment. Having that proximity and that relationship, you know, with two farms next to each other really is a very valuable key to, to farms surviving. Farms that are kind of out on their own, you know, don't have that kind of relationship with a neighbor. It's much harder, you know, to do it all on your own, all by yourself. It's a great comfort to know that your manure spreader breaks down, your neighbor, you know, is right there and you can borrow, um, and that it's always okay. Whenever they ask us for anything, it's always 100% yes. We sold our dairy cows a year and a half ago. We were losing $500 and a family to take care of is just not working. So we're trying to still make it, but it's a struggle. You know, we are two of the last farms that are still in existence in Jefferson. Um, you know, they are not doing dairy anymore. That was a very heartbreaking decision for them to sell their cows a little over a year ago. It broke my heart, too, when I heard they were doing that. But, you know, I completely understand, you know, why they made that decision. I have you know, tremendous respect um, for that decision that they made and the choices that they're making going forward. You know, they're really redefining their farm at this point. Do you think there's a, a potential to get farm help from the younger population? We bought a bigger baler this year so we didn't have to have any labor. Dairy farming in particular has always been about, you know, that next generation of children coming back and if you don't have that, you know, that within your own family then, you know, there's really, you know, most farms just, you know, that's it. It's over. What about getting some kids from like Cobleskill or Delhi from their ag programs? I mean, a lot of them go home for the summer or like cool internships. I mean, they're not going to want to go somewhere and make hay. Not somewhere like this. I mean, you know, they'll go to the, one of the industrial farms or they'll go to a big dairy or some place where they have nice equipment and can get paid and still do their internships. And as, you know, the younger generation um, these days is going out into the world and finding that there are much easier ways to make a living, there are many less of those children who are coming back into dairy farming in particular. My wife and I are teachers, and we um, had our daughter, and I've done a lot of reading and, and, and about food, and it kind of scared me with what was was out there and how I was raised and, and the stuff I didn't want my daughter eating. So we raised, we started off with 25 meat chickens and three pigs, and um, those um, was the start for us for our farm, and people would come for dinner and eat a chicken and go, oh my God, it's the best chicken I ever had, can you raise me 25? So we, our farm is built up over time, and um, you know, right now we do 400 meat birds and 20 some pigs a year. We do uh, 25 turkeys for Thanksgiving. We have about 40 laying hens. We have beehives, so we, it supplements um, our food, and we provide food for people who are, have similar interests than we do. Um, which I think, and the more people know about their food. Uh, more important, it's very important. People don't take it, yeah. don't understand how important the food is.
Um, it's usually for juniors and seniors. We have beehives on campus. In the past, we have done um, aquaponics and aquaculture um, using tilapia. Let's try to integrate a lot of stuff with the younger kids. We do hydroponics in uh, last year. We did a second grade classroom. With kids, my students would go in and teach the second graders um, what their uh, how to run the aquaponic hydroponic unit and um, harvest, and then we do like a, we'd make uh, honey-based salad dressing from our bee hive, have a salad party at the end of the project. Many of your like, your alumni students gone into like agri-science. Well, if, the kid would have to really work hard to be able to make enough money around here to, to be able to support themselves with those kind of programs. But I was looking more at where some of these dairy farm kids, if they want to continue to, to milk cows, could put up a greenhouse and do greens or do raspberries or something where they could supplement their income, at least pay for the taxes or you know give them a supplemental income just not doing just strictly dairy farm. So it was, that's my concept was sort of to give them more information and options to, to do things that... Um, outside the dairy farm. Little Jefferson I heard is going to start an egg math class. Yeah. Which I'm hoping she can use to do some of the same things I'm doing because you can apply the math to, I mean it's all math anyway. Mm -hmm. So math and science go together. So my name is Shannon Hayes and this you're visiting right now Sapbush Hollow Farm and I am a third generation farmer and my daughters who you see around here are fourth generations and I don't think we look like what you might expect a farm to look like. I developed a very different perspective on agriculture than conventional agriculture because if you look around the hills of this area you're looking at a piece of Schoharie County that was stamped non-viable for farming. And that's because after the, the agricultural industrial revolution happened, we were basically deemed unfit for business because they didn't want to bring the milk trucks up here. Then before that, we were becoming non-viable because hop farming was, everyone was looking at that commodity before it went to dairy. And this isn't commodity farming up here. We were obsolete already. And we were obsolete because the kind of farming that you can do up here is more anchored in subsistence agriculture. Um, from the 1840s forward, anyone who made it here made it because they provided for themselves and for the community first. So if you ask me about the future of agriculture, I think the future of agriculture is going to look like the land defining the people and the people interacting with the land. Why have we held on so long? I think it's because of that. There's so much, there's so much here that is so important to all of us. We fought really hard. <laughs> there were many moments where nobody would have blamed us for throwing in the towel, but we can't do it. We could sell the farm and probably have six, seven hundred thousand dollars in our pocket. I don't know, that'd be pretty tempting. What is it that keeps you going, working in ag? Uh, right now, it's just like the family farm. Well, you have true wealth. And if you ask about farmers with true wealth, you know, we'll tell you, oh, we don't get enough money, we don't get enough money. But that's not what true wealth is. True wealth is, I'm in love with that woman over there, she's my mom, and I want to be with her. And I want to spend my time <laughs> with my children, and it's my husband. True wealth is that hill that's out there. I can go and I can sit out here any day and I can climb that. True wealth is my neighbors who are sitting in there who love me and want me to thrive. From there, the next true wealth is, how well do I get to eat? How comfortably can I sleep at night because I'm peaceful and I'm happy? That's wealth. Money's bullshit when you look at that. And we want people to really understand, you know, where their food comes from and that it comes from a good place.
we believe in total transparency. You, you want to know what we do here? Please come to the farm, meet the animals, we'll show you everything. And we really want to be um, a very positive example of what dairy farming can be. And then the idea of a, a life-serving economy is once you recognize there's plenty of love, there's plenty of good clean air and water and these are the things we want, well then you cultivate those things. You don't try to create, make scarcity or extract them. You cultivate them. And then you cultivate them so I realize I have the love and support of my community. I invest back in the love and support of my community. And then they in turn invest back in me. And you know, that I think is really the only way, you know, for customers to really, you know, understand, have an understanding of what you do. We do believe in um, allowing more people on the farm. We do more farm tours now. We do, um, we have a tenter site on our farm to get people to put their feet on the soil because we've realized it's really hard to extract and destroy if you've fallen in love. And we believe in allowing people to have that contact with us because they fall in love. And when they fall in love, they protect. And that's our motivation to do that.